If you tend to go into a stress response when you try to communicate your emotions or what you need, it may be that you're showing the signs that you weren't listened to as a child. When you needed something, when you tried to stand up for yourself, when you tried to set a little kid's boundary, getting ignored and having to figure out everything by yourself as a child, it affects a person. And kids are supposed to learn how to be in the world from their parents. Parents are supposed to model it and teach it, how to speak, how to listen, how to interpret other people's actions. And parents are supposed to help their child learn how to express themselves in a way that works, that gets heard, that's clear, that's polite, that's assertive when it needs to be. You know, to say what they need, right? To ask questions when they're confused or to say no when something crosses their boundaries. Did you learn that at home? <laughs> There's a whole lot I didn't learn until much later in my life, how it's supposed to work. Uh, you know, attentive parents are very connected to the kid. They listen and they coach them. And if they're giving feedback but not listening, that's not going to help. Some parents aren't even saying anything and they're just not really there or they're literally not there. So if that's what happened to you, it wouldn't be surprising at all if social situations are really stressful for you as an adult. It's hard to have confidence in yourself when the way you relate to people had to be invented by a little kid, not by the well-adjusted grown-ups teaching you, but by you. Without parents who listen to you, your social development can end up having big holes in it, you know, chunks are missing. And of course you're going to struggle sometimes as a result of that. So what are the signs that someone wasn't listened to as a child? One is you may get anxious and angry when you try to put feelings into words, especially with people who you depend on, like an employer or a teacher or a partner. Now maybe you've repeated a pattern and unconsciously chosen people who don't listen, who don't want to hear you, can't hear you. Or maybe they listen to you, but you have so much fear you're going to be dismissed or ignored or belittled or not heard that your voice comes out angry. <laughs> That's a sign. And as you've probably noticed, getting wound up and angry when you're trying to say what you need tends to ruin your chances of getting what you need. Walking into interactions, you know, so sure that you're not going to get what you need can be a self-fulfilling prophecy. You can actually become someone who is in fact hard to listen to. And this is a horrible feeling because you're trying to connect and say what's going on, but then you're also feeling shame that you can't seem to do it right. So it's a double whammy. And this is really normal for people with childhood PTSD. But you might be someone who goes the other way. Instead of getting angry or anxious, you might lapse into fawning and people pleasing. You're so sure you won't be heard or cared about that you try to manipulate a good outcome by dancing around and proving how nice you are and how helpful you are and how many questions you ask about the other person and how they're feeling. And of course, this ends up not getting you heard either. Fawning feels like you're being nice, but to the other person, it can feel uncomfortable, like claustrophobia, like something that's not really real. So while it may have helped you survive childhood, it could be keeping you in relationships that are superficial. Your performance of being a nice person isn't really something someone can be friends with or fall in love with. It's, it's, it's a performance. It's like putting a wall up. Another sign that you may have noticed is that group dynamics are overwhelming for you. That happens to people who weren't listened to as kids. You feel like you get overlooked. You don't get your turn or you worry you're not going to get your turn or you feel like everyone else is taking up all the space in the room and all the opportunities to say something and you get resentful. You feel pushed out. That's a horrible feeling too. And it's also one of those dynamics that can be made worse when you feel anxious and angry going into that group setting because you can end up seeming defensive or aggressive or not emotionally safe for other people to be around, huh? It's understandable that you got this way. You had to defend yourself and fight to exist and you probably had to hide a lot of anger. But the thing is, when you're hiding anger, healthy people can sense it. Their nervous system is sensing your anger, but you're forcing a smile and saying everything's fine. And they'll perceive you as something's off, as untrustworthy. Something doesn't feel right when you say one thing, but feel, you know, give off a vibe of another. 
So if you've been having a rough time being connected with people and you feel like you've done such a great job of being cool and nice and agreeable, you may want to ask yourself if you're suppressing anger. Anger, both the repressed kind and the kind that's totally out there and, you know, being expressed is the hallmark behavior of someone who grew up not listened to. It makes people mad. Maybe you only express yourself when you're crying. The feelings come out as tears. That's a sign. Or maybe you only express yourself when you're so angry you can't take it anymore and you're yelling and banging things around. Or maybe you just get frozen in silence, shutting people out. And I'm not saying you should run around telling everyone why you're so angry all the time, but in the long run, if you don't find a healthy way to express anger or express what's bothering you before it becomes anger, you're putting a big strain on your relationships. Okay, there are also non-angry, just communication style things that people do when they weren't listened to as a kid. What do you do in a conversation where there's a long silence? Does it make you really uncomfortable and give you, make you feel like you need to have to rush in and say something? Because that often comes from a deep fear that if somebody isn't talking, the other person is about to abandon you. And it's this reflex like, oh, hold on, I'll keep talking. No, wait, no pauses, don't go away. <laughs> like you have to keep them connected to you before they get away. And very similar to this is talking too fast. I used to talk too fast. I had to consciously work on slowing that down. And you might think I talk fast now, but you should have heard me before. And I, I was just insecure and I was trying to not take up too much of the other person's time basically with my needs, which I thought would be perceived as stupid. Like, I'm so sorry, I'm saying something, but I'll make it really fast so you won't have to deal with me for long. And of course it's stressful listening to someone who talks fast. It doesn't make you think, oh, what a considerate person giving me extra time. Coping mechanisms are always just crap at getting the results you're trying to get, right? Another sign you weren't listened to as a kid is that you, you get overly intense when you're saying something, especially if you're saying something about feelings, that someone hurt you, or oh God, that you need help with something, because you're afraid you won't be helped, and you might not even be believed, you know, that's the fear. So I used to do this every time I got sick, and I'd, I'd say to my boyfriend at the time, well, I'm sick, and he'd go, oh, okay, and I'd go, no, I'm really sick, look, my eyes are glassy, I think I have a fever, I feel awful, my stomach hurts. And I go into this big story, this big list of problems so that I could be believed. And I was already believed. And the irony is because I was talking so much about my symptoms and going over and over them, making such a big deal, I kind of ended up getting perceived as a hypochondriac. And it sounded like exaggeration. And actually exaggeration is something that people do when they weren't listened to as kids, also bragging. When I was a kid though, the one thing that would bring my mother to my side was when I was sick. And I don't think I ever faked it, except maybe to skip school sometimes. I mean, who didn't do that, right? But to this day, I can still get very, you know, weird and prickly when I'm sick because I'm anticipating, you know, there's just this lingering defensive fight in me about, you know, I, I'm sick, so don't even think of ignoring me. <laughs> it's a fight about whether they're gonna take care of me or believe me. And it's kind of like birthdays. I still, yeah, it's gone pretty well for a few years, but it used to be very easy to feel that no matter how much anyone tried, I was just so sure they didn't really care and that my birthday was a nuisance to them. And first I felt guilty for having the birthday and then I felt mad that they hadn't made a big enough deal. And, um, you know, trying to talk through <laughs> complicated old fears and resentments like that is what we call processing and you can process some of this stuff to death. And it's not a good relationship thing where you're looking to someone else to fix you and they try, but of course it doesn't fix you. Anger and anxiety can also be called fear and resentment. And I have techniques for releasing those, as you may know, if you've tried my daily practice techniques, they're always linked below. I'll mention that at the end. When you have fear and resentment, you might repeat yourself or you might start talking louder and louder, kind of verbally bullying someone so that they keep listening whether they want to or not, whether they feel that you've answered your concern or not. You might start interrupting them because you're so afraid that you're not being heard. Now, if you weren't listened to as a kid, you might even get angry or defensive when people ask questions for clarifications like, well, what do you mean? What do you mean? What do I mean? Or, you know, they go, what? Could you say that again? It's like, how many times do I have to repeat myself? Because of the filter of your past trauma that overlays everything, you think they're challenging you. 
Or maybe because you know your anger is going to create problems, you start acting like the class clown, like, I know you don't want to listen to me, but maybe I can entertain you and get my point across with humor. And you're thinking, then you won't think I'm an angry person. You know? <laughs> and along the same lines, you might hedge what you're trying to say. And you say, well, I don't know, maybe it's just me, but <clears throat> I don't actually like being treated rudely. <laughs> or maybe it's just me, but the tablecloth is on fire. I don't know where I got that, except, well, Christmas, two Christmases ago, <laughs> my brother-in-law um, introduced us to the woman he is now married to. She's very cool. And <laughs> she came over and it was Christmas time and I had set up this beautiful decorations on the dining room table. We ate at the kitchen table, but the dining room table, it had candles and this like woven Norwegian table runner that's traditional. You know, my mom's Norwegian. It was beautiful. There was all this stuff and little little ceramic houses. It was so charming. We're eating dinner and all of a sudden I hear this crackling. And I was like, what? And I go into the dining room and I look and it's like the dining room is like massively, the table is on fire. It's reaching up to the ceiling. And I was like, ha, ah, yes, everybody get in here. And I really liked my future sister-in-law because she was so cool about it and she thought it was funny. And she helped me get like some blankets and put the fire out and it was fine. The table's slightly damaged forever, but whatever. The house didn't burn down. That was how I made a first impression on her, was <laughs> causing a house fire. Anyway, one classic childhood PTSD behavior is over self-disclosure. Was that over self-disclosure? No, that's a perfectly appropriate story for this. But you tell people too much about yourself too soon or at an inappropriate time, like their mom just died. And instead of giving them some empathy, you tell a long story about what happened when your mom died. And I know that's intended as a way to feel connected and show that you do understand, but it's a telltale sign that listening empathically was not something done enough for you, right? In childhood. Not being cared about, not being heard can leave a residue of fear and resentment. And sometimes people who are carrying a lot of those feelings just shut down, you know, just mm. And this can create a different problem where you feel like you have to sit and listen to someone who's talking too much to you, or they're insulting you, or you're interested, but you can't see a way to get up and leave. And this is a fawn response that turns into a freeze response when what you need in that situation is a flight response. Just fly out of that conversation. Yes, thanks, bye. <laughs> so the irony is that after all this time wanting to be heard, it can be really weird when someone does listen to you. This used to actually make me feel dysregulated. And when I think about it, it still sometimes does. Now, four or five years ago, I got to meet Pete Walker. And he's a therapist. He's like such an important person. I got his advice. He's the person who wrote the book CPTSD from surviving to thriving. And he's the one who came up with the concept of emotional flashbacks and abandonment melange, two names for things that I had been experiencing all my life that having the name was life changing. Like when somebody names something, when they give you a name for it, you're like, it's a thing. I'm not crazy. It's a common symptom. And I talk about these more deeply in other videos, but uh, emotional flashbacks and abandonment melange. So I was just starting to coach people. This was four or five years ago. And I needed some help knowing where to set a boundary when people were asking for my help, but they seemed to be a danger to themselves. You know, and I'm not a therapist or doctor. And I wanted to know, like, how do you gracefully handle that? And his advice was great. And he, he told me exactly when it was time to refer someone to a hotline or licensed professional. And, you know, let me off the hook. Like, don't, I don't even have to try to do that. I don't have to try to like save somebody's life on YouTube or somewhere where I don't even know where they are. And I'll forever be grateful for his clarity about that. But oh my gosh, Pete Walker has presence, man. <laughs> when he's listening to you, it's intense. I mean, he is like fully listening. And next thing you know, boop, I couldn't feel my hands. I was totally dysregulated. Now, not to fawn, but is it just me? Do you get dysregulated when somebody really listens to you? Every time I spot an odd thing like that, a trauma symptom, it's an opportunity um, for me to be able to open, open it up, you know, like what's in that box and face it and free myself from it using my tools or mostly free myself from it. 
I'm always a work in progress. So this was back when I first started Crappy Childhood Fairy. And if you look at my really old videos, not only do they have, you know, terrible low sound levels and problems with color and camera focus, but you'll see that I say, uh, and um, and every 10th word, and I'm sort of flopping around the screen like this. And I'd be editing my own videos and I would just go, oh my gosh, I can't put this up on YouTube. I had to, you know? but I was dying inside. And so what I did is I went to Toastmasters and I got really into it to teach myself to speak impactfully. And I got the insight that saying um and like and so all the time, which I still do sometimes, but they're called filler words. And it's just another way of trying to keep someone interested the hard way. It's actually okay to hold a silence. See what I mean? Like you stayed with me for that, right? Saying um has the opposite effect of looking unprofessional or looking like whatever I'm gonna say isn't that important. It squanders people's attention. So another thing that squanders the attention someone gives you is not to listen to them because you're so busy thinking like, what am I gonna say? What am I gonna say? What am I gonna say next? Oh, I know, I said this. And then you wait, you wait, you wait for them to finish their sentence and you're like, yeah, I know. <laughs> and that's a, that's a thing people do when they weren't listened to as kids strategizing. It's got to get this right so that they don't leave the conversation. So it's all right. It's, it's not your fault you were neglected as a kid. You deserve to have wonderful connections to people now and to become fully yourself and to express yourself so your life can take shape around who you really are. Childhood trauma can really damage a person's ability to connect with people and to communicate authentically. So luckily there's so much you can do to heal and change even now, even if you're in your 50s or your 60s or your 70s or later. So if you want to use those techniques to release that fear and resentment that kind of drives you to have difficulty connecting with people and dealing with that wound of not being listened to, I've got a free course for you called The Daily Practice. These are the techniques that I've used for 29 years to keep releasing fear and resentment and continue to heal. And you can download that free course right here, click there, and I will see you very soon.